Thank you, Tina. How amazing is Tina? Round of applause for Tina. Talk about a force. Um, would anybody mind if I actually go by the name Denim Millbabe anymore uh, uh, from now on? I, I kind of. Babe. I like the babe part best. I am nervous. I am nervous. And all of my students out there are probably going, ha ha, told ya. So I had a bit of, um, I was flummoxed about this presentation today. Um, wanted to do something new. I wanted to do something that would be entertaining and inspiring. And so I was really struggling about what to talk about. And I started to put together a presentation that I had been working on for about the last year, which talks about the evolution of behavior as it relates to branding and as it relates to cultural norms. Um, and then I wrote to Tina and I said, Tina, what, should I, what would you like me to present? Would you like me to present something inspiring and entertaining? Would you like me to present something tactical and practical, something that people can really learn from and take with them? And she wrote back and said, I think tactical and practical might be better. And so that was the end of that presentation. And so then I started to do sort of an ABCs of branding um, a little bit about um, how we've gotten to this place uh, in our culture with branding and what's the big difference between Coke and Pepsi and Tropicana and Minute Maid. And then I realized that that really wasn't inspiring or entertaining or tactical and practical. And so that was the end of that one. And then finally, I decided that maybe I would do something more conceptual and artistic and started to put together something about meaning and our place in the world. And um, then I decided that that had absolutely no relevance to anything, and that was the end of that one. When I mentioned it to Jamie, the director of operations at um, the SVA Masters in Branding program, she thought this might be a good opportunity to break out the um, interpretive dance. And then I really knew that it was a good decision that I didn't choose this one to do. So what I decided to do was something um, a little bit revealing, a little bit um, tactical and practical, and I'm hoping inspiring and entertaining. And it's a little bit of uh, a presentation that I've put together over the years to help my students um, and also to inspire them, but it also has a lot of new things as I am now approaching 30 years in the design business, believe it or not, denim mill babe that I am. <laughs> so when I told um, my dear colleague Lisa about the title, she said, are you gonna talk about boys? And I didn't really learn anything about boys when I was um, graduating college, so the answer is no to that one. So this is a presentation about things that I wish that I knew when I graduated college and started this journey, this 30 year now journey in the design business. Um, and so I'm going to try to pepper it with funny, anecdotal, entertaining and inspiring stories, but for the most part, I think it will fulfill Tina's request that it be something that people can learn from. So number one, um, the first thing that I wish that I knew when I graduated college is that Design talent is essentially equivalent to what is called operational excellence in the business world. And operational excellence is essentially um, what it takes to operate a business or a service well. Um, but in many ways, it's really point of entry. Um, you turn on a light switch and the lights go on. That reflects the operational excellence of the electric company. Um, when somebody is interviewing you to do a design job, they expect that you know how to design. That's why they're considering you to do this design job. That has gotten you to the place 
where it is logical that you'd be considered. You know how to design, you call yourself a designer, and there's an assumption that you're a designer. But that's really not what it takes to get the job. Design is one of the most subjective disciplines out there. I wanna ask a question of the audience. Who here thinks that Salvador Dali is a good painter? Raise your hands, please. Okay, who here doesn't think that Salvador Dali is a particularly good or inspiring painter? Okay, so we have people that think that he is a good painter and people that think that he isn't a good painter. Well, the fact of the matter is, Salvador Dali is in museums all over the world and despite whether or not we personally think he's good or bad, there's an accepted benchmark of his being quite excellent. But it's essentially something that as the viewer, we are bringing an opinion to. And it's very much the same way with design. In fact, it's more so because there aren't design museums all over the world with people that are designated as masters. And so when anybody is looking at your portfolio or your work, it is going to be through the lens of what they believe is good or not. And because there isn't as much criteria as there is as, say, what it takes to be an excellent mathematician or an excellent scientist, with design, it's far more up to the viewer to decide. And so when you are expecting talent to get you into a many opportunities, because every other designer that's competing for a particular job or a particular project also has talent, it is ultimately going to be up to the person that's viewing that work to determine whether they think your talent is better than somebody else's talent. And the only way that they're going to be able to assess that, because most of the people that are hiring us to do design don't know design. That's why they're hiring a designer. They're not educated in kerning or the fundamentals of color theory or the golden ratio. They don't understand what it means to be a great designer. They're just looking at things in the way that they look at things. Hmm, I don't like purple, so forget that one. Let's throw away that portfolio. So it really requires an ability to be able to talk about what you do in a way that allows the viewer to be able to understand what your message is. I was talking to somebody recently about what, does, what makes designers so special. And I've always felt that it is our incredible ability to provide empathy in any particular situation. We need to have an enormous amount of empathy to be able to understand messaging in a way to take a very specific message and be able to communicate that to a large number of people. If we're needing to communicate something to a large number of people, we have to understand something about the way people perceive and understand. Um, but I was talking to somebody and she said, actually, I think it's much more than that. I think that we have to be thinking 10 steps ahead, almost like a chess game, that if we communicate this way, then somebody's gonna understand this this way and then this way and then this way. So I think ultimately, design talent is just the basic point of entry for any designer starting to think about a career in design. And um, so that's number one. Number two, design is not about design. Design is about a whole lot of other things that ultimately result in design. And so in today's world, we need to have an understanding of anthropology, of psychology, of economics. We need to be able to understand from a cultural anthropological point of view why we are in the world we are right in right now. Design does more now than it ever does before. Through design, we signal our affiliations. Through design, we signify our beliefs. And we create tribes just by the telegraphic nature of understanding how somebody looks, the things that they carry, what they drink, the sneakers that they wear. And if we're not able to understand what is happening culturally that impacts the way we choose things, the way we see things, and the way that we behave, we'll never be able to really engage and solicit the imagination of the people that we're designing for. 
It's also very much about understanding behavioral psychology because everything, everything in our world, everything that we see, everything that we believe in, everything that we engage in starts first in the brain. And the brain is the, this magnificent machine that allows us to perceive whatever it is we're perceiving. And we have the ability at any given time to see millions and millions and millions of bits of data subconsciously. But consciously, we're actually only able to see about 40 things at any given time, consciously. And as a result, we are constantly living through our own patterns and creating our own patterns of recognition to be able to understand the world. And the best example that I can give you is when we buy a car. If we haven't bought that mo model before, when we're driving that car on the road, once we're in it, we begin to see that car everywhere, that model everywhere. Whereas before, we might not have noticed. And what that allows us to realize about our behavior is that our awareness is very much impacted by the things that we have around us. And so in order to break through those existing patterns of recognition that people have, especially as designers, when we want them to see something new or feel something new, or perceive something new. We have to understand how to be able to navigate through that pattern, those existing patterns, to be able to get them to understand something that we're creating. And it's also very much about economics. I think that what most people realize, don't realize, is that people hire us to create design for them in order to sell more product, communicate an idea better, to move things off a shelf. They're giving us, people are giving us money to do what we love. But they're not really interested in that. They're interested in moving more product or communicating more clearly or winning an election. And so what we need to realize is that our clients are looking for a return on the investment of giving that money to us for us to do what we love. And so it's not a matter of showing our clients what we think is great or beautiful or breakthrough. It's really a matter of showing how what we design is going to help people understand what they're selling or messaging in a more profound way. I think it's also a very difficult time for design in that in the last couple of years through the recession, people have been talking more and more about the value proposition of design. But I actually rather like to see it more as what makes something valuable as opposed to what the value proposition is. And I'll talk a little bit about more why I think that in a moment, but essentially what we want to do with design is not communicate a difference in a form or a flavor or a belief, but really a difference in how this particular thing, whatever it is, is going to make a difference in somebody's life. And when it makes a difference in somebody's life, then they'll be willing to pay for it in many ways, no matter what it costs. And I'll talk about why in a moment. The last thing that it requires is something that you probably, um, if you were here from Michael Beirut's presentation, probably already know, and that is you need to have an encyclopedic knowledge of everything. I mean, there's nobody smarter in the design business than Michael Beirut, and he often talks about how even though he has a design education, he really wished that when he was going to school, he was able to learn more about everything else but design, because everything else fuels the way that we design. And the smarter we are in the world about anthropology and behavioral psychology and economics, the more informed our work is going to be, and ultimately the more powerful our work is going to be. So that brings us to number three. And this one was a really tough one to learn. And so Lisa, here's where I might ever so slightly talk about boys. Um, there are two things that are really not about what we think they're about, money and sex. Money is not about money, and sex is not about sex. I'm not gonna talk about the sex part, <laughs> at least not now. But money is never about money. And I'm, I think the best example that I can give you is what happens when Steve Jobs launches, releases some new trinket that we all are madly, 
passionately coveting. It might cost more than any of the other products on the market, but there's something about those products that make us feel absolutely okay, if not somewhat um, disappointed, but, but absolutely okay that we have to pay more money for. We expect, actually, that Apple products are going to cost more money. So if somebody really, really wants something, if they really, really need something, they're going to figure out a way to pay for it, even if they don't necessarily have the money. They'll go in debt on their credit card. They'll borrow money from a friend or a parent. They'll steal it. There's any number of ways that people will let themselves get something that they don't want. So one of the things that I want to tell you is that if somebody tells you that they don't want something that you're selling because they can't afford it, it's really just a nice way of them saying they don't want to hire you or they don't like you enough to spend the money. Or you have not convinced them that the value that you will provide will be valuable enough for them to pay more. So money is rarely about money. And if anybody wants to talk about why sex is never about sex, I'll do that after the presentation. Number four, ideas are easy. Strategy is much harder. Ideas are so easy for designers. I can ask everybody in this room, everybody in this room, to come up with a fabulous new label for Izzy Soda. You could all do it in about 15 minutes. But if I asked you to come up with an idea for a soda that had never been developed before, totally new selling proposition, that would take a lot more time. That might take forever, given how many carbonated soft drinks there are on the market. Strategy is much harder. Coming up with a unique point of difference for a product or an idea is incredibly, incredibly difficult. Now, over the last 10 years, we've heard that word strategy next to design ad infinitum. And almost everybody I know thinks that they do strategic design. When I do lectures like this and I talk about strategy, I often ask a very, very simple question. What is strategy? And even though there are hundreds or thousands or millions of people that think that they do strategic design, I'm never able to get from the audience, when I ask this question, the Michael Peters, I'm sorry, the Michael Porter, Harvard Business School definition of strategy. And I find that really sad. Because if we're saying we do something, we should know what it is we're doing. And so when we're talking about strategic design, I think that there's really only one lens that you can look at strategic design through, and that is the Harvard Business School definition of what strategy is. So I thought that I would share that with you so that we have it. And this sort of, I think, fulfills Tina's request for tactical and practical. So according to Michael Porter from Harvard Business School, the definition of strategy is, strategy is choosing to perform activities differently or to perform distinctly different activities than rivals. And I love this definition because I think it's so clear. There are really only two ways into doing strategic design. The first is choosing to perform activities differently. And the best example I can give is Starbucks. There were millions and millions and millions of coffee shops before Starbucks entered the picture. But Starbucks fundamentally changed the way we experience a coffee shop. So that's choosing to perform activities differently. Performing different, distinctly different activities than rivals is, our, of course, our favorite poster child, Apple. There were MP3 players on the market before the iPod came out, but they created a platform that included iTunes, which changed the game forever. So they chose to perform distinctly different activities than rivals. There was no other MP3 player that was linked to a music system quite in the way that iTunes was linked with the iPad. So they chose to perform distinctly different activities than rivals. Both of these lenses into strategic design 
provide an opportunity to create a game changer. And ultimately, I think that's really what we're looking for. Nobody is looking to do design that's just like somebody else's. We don't go into a project thinking, I'm gonna do a me too design. I wanna do something just like so and so and hope that nobody notices. We really want to do something that changes the game. And so this is really the only two ways in to consider that. One of the other things about strategy that I think is so fascinating and how helpful it is to design is that ultimately it takes away much of the subjectivity that we, that our clients have in evaluating design. So if our design fulfills either of these two entry points, then ultimately it's not about whether somebody likes it or not. It's about whether it's going to perform or not and whether it is going to be able to provide a return on investment for the clients that we're working for. And it allows them to feel much more comfortable about creating a game, a, a game changing platform. Because many, many, many clients aren't gonna have the vision of a Starbucks or an Apple. Most projects, there's an enormous amount of fear that anything that's going to be done is going to destroy the market share or fail. Most consumers don't look at new things and say, ooh hoo, something new is gonna change my life, yay. That reptilian part of our brain is actually always looking out and making sure that we're not vulnerable to things. So anytime we see something new, it becomes a bit of a question and we become skeptical about whether it's going to impact our lives in a good way or a bad way. So it's very important if we have a strategic reason for being, if we're creating something that is either going to perform distinctly different activities than rivals or perform different activities, then chances are we're going to be able to create something that has a lot more meaning. And you need to know in, in developing your strategy, whether it be a strategy for yourself, as a designer, as a practitioner, as a marketer, as a consultant, or for a product, you need to know what you are doing and why. So many people I know, when, especially when I'm interviewing, I'll ask somebody, well, what makes you different from all of your other counterparts or your graduating class? And they'll talk about being a people person or they'll talk about knowing a lot about a lot of different things and they'll be very affable and friendly. But they don't necessarily know why they have chosen design. Oftentimes I'll hear that, well, it's artistic and it, it pays more than, than being a painter. You need to know what you believe in. You need to know why you're doing what you're doing. What is your mission as a designer? Why have you chosen design? How are you going to make a difference with your work? Otherwise, what is differentiating you from anybody else? Again, if a client that's hiring you isn't a designer, how do they know that you're better than anybody else that they're seeing? It becomes either a beauty contest or a popularity contest. So you need to be able to understand what it is you do and why and be able to communicate that in a really easy one sentence experience. What I call the, the elevator experience. If somebody says, oh, why are you a designer? Or why, why do you do what you do? And my, my mission is really simple and people sometimes laugh when I, when I tell them what it is, but I really truly believe it and I find it to be a noble thing. And I think that's really all that matters. You need to know what you believe in, whether or not it's popular. You know, Martin Luther King didn't go around saying, I have a dream. Let's see how many people in that focus group will like that line. He believed it. And, and my mission is really very simple. It's to make the supermarket a more beautiful place. But I, and I really, truly believe that passionately. And it informs every single thing that I do. I find that fascinating and endlessly interesting and challenging. So you need to know what your mission is and be able to communicate it in a way that people will fundamentally understand. And ultimately, I think you need to believe it so thoroughly that it becomes part of your DNA. It's not something false, it's not something phony, it's not something that you're hoping will impress people, it's just honest and authentic and part of who you are. So number five. Um, this, is, this is one of the, um, this, is, this is one of the things that I learned um, kind of the hard way, because I think that especially young designers and recent graduates want to be seen as knowing it all. Um, but I, I'm gonna share an anecdote that I've shared before, but um, I see a lot of people in the audience that I've ne never met before, so I think it will be meaningful even to the people that have heard this before. I think it's really, really important to tell the truth. And 
I learned this best when I was with my goddaughter many, many, many years ago. She's in college now, so this was back when she was in elementary school. And she was first learning about computers. And she was really excited about the fact that she was learning about computers, particularly because I spend my entire day on a computer and had then as well. And so we were talking about what she was learning and she was trying very um, diligently to express what it was that she was learning. And she was having a particularly difficult time with the language, with what it was that she was learning, how she was learning it, and she was really having a very difficult time communicating and stammering and hemming and hawing. And finally she stopped. And she looked at me and she took a big deep breath and she said, Debbie, life is so difficult when you don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I think that's the smartest thing that anybody has ever said to me. Because we, we get in our own way. We self-sabotage so many times. People will ask us if we know something and we feel that we have to impress them by saying yes. And then inevitably, the question after that will be, well, why or how? And then all of a sudden you're like, uh, and making things up and just saying random words. Yellow, pink, I don't know, kerning, kerning. Um, <laughs> and I, I, I think that if there's, there's nothing wrong with saying that you don't know something, especially if you're a recent graduate. That's the time in your life when you're not expected to know anything. And I think what happens when we admit that we don't know something, it gives somebody else an opportunity to share something that then creates more of a rapport and a mutuality than there might have been with you pretending that you knew something and not actually being able to have a genuine dialogue about that. People love to teach. People love to teach things. People love to actually know something that other people don't know. And so if you admit that you don't know something, then somebody will share that with you and then you can learn. So it's an opportunity to actually be educated. So, so I urge the, the people that are just starting out to, to try to tell the truth. I wanna ask a question for a second. How many people here have ever lied? How many people here have ever lied? How many people here have ever been lied to and kind of knew they were being lied to when the lie was being told? Okay, so you know what that means, right? That means that even when you're lying, chances are people know that you're lying. And once somebody knows that you're not telling the truth and that you're not genuine, any trust that is possible with somebody com gets completely obliterated. So I think it's better to tell the truth and admit what you don't know than lie and pretend that you know something that you don't, that somebody probably realizes that you don't know that you don't know. So number six, common vocabulary does not equate with common behavior. And the best example I can give you here is when you say, I love you to somebody. So you can say, I love you to somebody and if they don't love you back, they could still say that they love you, but not in that way. But it's, this, it's still the same language. They love you, but they don't love you in that way that you love them. And I think this is one of the biggest issues that designers have with business people and with marketers, is that the language that's being used might actually be similar, but the meaning and the interpretation of those words could be very, very different. So we, for example, at Sterling could be going into a meeting with a CEO who says that they want to really change the game with this package or with this logo, really do something revolutionary, put a stake in the ground, let's make a difference. And then when we come back for the first phase design presentation, they look at the work and they get completely freaked out because it's too revolutionary and actually what they meant by revolutionary was going from light blue to dark blue. <laughs> and unless you're IBM, not really sure that that's revolutionary. So it's really important to be able to understand the vocabulary of direction prior to starting any design job. And ultimately, the best way to capture all of that is with a design brief or a creative brief. And I believe that working one day, one day working on a design brief is worth at least a week of design time because you're not spinning your wheels so much and you're actually literally and figuratively 
agreeing on what the language means, what the words mean. But you also need to make sure that it's differentiating enough to allow you to do some interesting and breakthrough work. I was at a design summit many years ago for a client, and all the design agencies came together and were talking about the issues in dealing with that client. And he um, showed the audience one of the design briefs that he was given by this client. And the target market for this design brief was relevant, contemporary, and for today's mom. So he said, now wait a second. If you didn't tell me that, do you think that I would be designing for irrelevant, old-fashioned, yesterday's moms? Probably not. I don't know that anybody that necessarily needs to be told that something needs to be relevant and contemporary. And what does that mean? So the language that we use in our creative briefs needs to be differentiating enough to allow us to be able to do good work that is permissible at the very, very start of a project. Number seven. Is this getting too preachy? No? Okay, good, good. Number seven. Relentlessly prepare. This is something I also learned the hard way. Simon, I don't know if you remember when we went to, you, I don't know that you were there at the time at the meeting, but we did a, a job about eight years ago for Star Wars. And uh, we, for the first time in my life, I got an opportunity to go to Skywalker Ranch, which was incredibly exciting. Now the design team that we put on the job were people that were real Star Wars aficionados, like people with the packages that are on shelves that they dust in their apartments. And so, of course, we thought, well, those are the people we want on the job because they really fundamentally understand the Star Wars zeitgeist. And we were so excited by the work that we did. We were also madly in love with the work that we did that we were actually high-fiving each other in the parking lot before we even went into the meeting because we were just so proud of ourselves for getting to that place. Like, wow, we're at Skywalker Ranch about to show work for Star Wars. And when we got to the meeting, when we got into the meeting, something happened that had never happened before in my life. I mean, I've had clients not like some work in a meeting, in an, in a, an exploratory presentation, but I've never had an, an experience where they hated everything, like hated everything. It had never occurred to me that that could happen. And I think it's really important that designers prepare themselves for every possible opportunity that could occur when showing our work. We were so taken aback that, of course, we had the reaction that most people have when clients don't like our work, which is like, are you an idiot? I mean, we didn't say that, but clearly we were defensive and trying to convince them that our work was good. And if anybody's ever been in a department store and been told by a salesperson that they look good in a pair of jeans that they know their butt looks fat in, you know you can't be persuaded to like something that you know you don't like. It's just not gonna happen no matter how many people tell you that something is good, on, it looks good or is good. If you don't think so, no one is ever going to be able to persuade you. And if you keep fighting for it, it will just end badly. So we ended up retreating and redoing all of the work, but the lesson for me was I need to be able to understand what all the possible outcomes are when I present work. What if they like everything? What if they don't like everything? What if they don't like the thing that I love best? What if they love best the thing that I'm only showing them because I feel like we need to show them something safe? What do you do? Rudy Giuliani used to say that for every hour he spent in court, he used to spend four hours preparing. So I think that designers need to not necessarily rehearse, because I think that sometimes that scripted rehearsal can ultimately end up in something that feels canned. But I think you absolutely need to ask yourself, what, is the re what are the possible reactions that could happen, and what will I do if that happens? And it allows you to be much more prepared for any outcome. And so if you're able to visualize every scenario, if you're, ever, if you're able to anticipate the unanticipated, I think ultimately it will make you feel more powerful when you're presenting. And one of the best examples that I like to give is what happens in a basketball game. People talk about how everything in a basketball game happens in the last two minutes of a basketball game, in the last two minutes of the fourth quarter. But if a team is losing at the last, in the last two minutes of the fourth quarter, the coach doesn't get the team around him and say, now I want everybody to work as hard as you can in these last two minutes. Like, pass the ball, run fast. They have a game plan. 
They have a point of view. They actually have things that they've learned how to do when in that situation that then ultimately gives them a much more competitive opportunity to win the game. So what happens? If you think about what you might do if these situations occur, you'll ultimately be much more equipped to deal with them. Number eight. I read a book a couple of years ago by Patrick Lencioni that talked about what he called artificial harmony. And artificial harmony is one of those things that happens when you're in a meeting and nobody wants to tell the truth. People are human, by human, in human nature, human, humans are really reluctant to, conf to confront each other over things. I think also, that's also why text messaging now is, is so popular. You know, people don't like confrontation. They don't like to be confronted and they don't like to confront. So when you're showing work in a meeting, Chances are you're not going to get the reaction that we got at Star Wars that day, which is, we hate everything, what are you, crazy? It's more like, oh, okay, okay, this is, this is good, good, okay. And then you leave the meeting, and chances are you and your partners or your colleagues all look at each other, and because they said, yeah, you know, it's good, it's good, that you all like, that was a good meeting. They said it was good. And you, you, know, you tell yourself what they told you. But I guarantee when those situations happen, chances are by the time you get back to your office, there's an email or a phone call waiting for you that says, now that we've had more of an opportunity to look at the work, we think that it's really not as good as we thought it was. That always happens, always. Whenever you get that vibe that somebody isn't madly in love with the work, it's because they're not madly in love with the work. There's, there's, nobody like holds back because they don't want to share the excitement that they feel in front of you. It just doesn't happen that way. If you get that vibe, it's because it's real. And what I tend to do in those situations is give people the permission to feel that. And so I'll just say something really non-defensive, something like, I'm sensing that you don't love this work as much as you were hoping you would. And then that gives them the permission to say, yeah, you really didn't hit the mark and that it's, it still gives you the opportunity to keep that trust that you've developed and come up with a game plan together as opposed to going back to your office and having to repair everything that disappointed them in the next meeting, which then tends to be a week or so later and there's all that time for doubt to grow and they've no longer got the confidence in you to be able to solve their problem. And then maybe they're starting to think about other people that they might work with. And before you know it, there's like five other people on the project. So I, I recommend, if you feel that, if you sense that artificial harmony, then I would suggest acting on it. Number nine, seek out criticism. I often talk to my students about three ways of knowing things. We know what we know. So I know I'm a woman. I know that I'm reaching a, an age milestone and a, a yearly milestone in my work and what I'm doing. I know I'm left-handed. I know I'm a Scorpio. I know what I don't know. I know that I'm not a mathematician. I know that I'm not a brain surgeon. I know that I can't read music and I play the guitar really badly. But there's this third thing. So I know what I know and I know what I don't know. But what we don't know is what we don't know. That's the important stuff to know. The only way to be able to find that out is to ask somebody. It's sort of like having spinach on your teeth. It's there, but you don't know it. The only way to find out is either to look in the mirror, which you might not necessarily be able to do at that moment, or to have somebody tell you. And so what I tell people now when I'm looking at their portfolios or when I'm teaching them about showing their portfolio, especially in the early stages of the career, is ask people that you're showing your work to that you respect, what is the one thing in the portfolio that you would take out? And if you start to hear that same thing over and over and over again by people, you know you should probably take it out. It's also important in a portfolio not to have things in your portfolio just because you want to show somebody that you can do that type of work. So you have a book cover in your portfolio because you want people to know you can do book covers. If it's a crappy design, nobody's gonna hire you to do a book cover. So only have work in your portfolio that you love. It's better to have less things in your portfolio 
and have them all be things that you're proud of, that you can defend, that you can talk about strategically, than something that's filler or something that somebody is going to feel represents some aspect of what you're capable of doing. Because that never works and it ends up diluting the overall impact of your work. And I think for, for people that are just graduating college, if you're not making enough mistakes, you're not taking enough risks. This is the time in your life, probably the only time in your life where it's absolutely acceptable to fall on your face. And fall on your face, fall on your face a lot. I remember the summer after I graduated college standing at the intersection of Bleecker Street and Sixth Avenue, peering into my future and thinking, I, I don't know how I'm gonna do this. I think I have to, I think I have to curb my ambition because I don't think I'm gonna be able to be successful. And I spent the first 10 years of my career afraid to do anything, because I was afraid that I would fail. And so ultimately, I think that you have to live as if it doesn't matter if you make a mistake, at least at the beginning, which is really, really hard to do. But that gets me to number 10. And ultimately, <laughs> it's sort of an odd segue, but you need to know how to present. You need to know how to talk about your work and you need to know how to talk about what you do, even if you are afraid and even if you are nervous. I talk about an article that I read about Barbara Streisand many years ago in The New Yorker. And I think if anybody watched the Grammys last week, you'll, you'll see evidence of this. Um, somebody was asking her manager, I guess the reporter was asking her manager what um, her greatest talent was. And he said, well, actually her greatest talent isn't um, singing or um, directing or acting or even how longevity in the business. Her greatest talent is doing all of those things even while experiencing de debilitating stage fright. And if anybody saw the Grammys, after she finished singing, she actually said, I think she thought we had, that, that they had gone to commercial was, I can't believe how nervous I am. Barbara Streisand, I mean, it's amazing. So I think if we approach our work knowing how to present, it'll give us tools that help us circumvent the nerves or the fear. I think that if you don't know how to present, because presenting is a skill, take a class. Presenting is a skill in the same way that design is a series of skills. Presenting is a science and an art. And it must be something that you learn how to do. If you have problems speaking, work with a voice coach. It is the single most important skill to learn in being a successful designer, aside from design. And so just some advice. Um, I, I recommend that you work as hard as you can and work harder than everybody else. You must keep presenting over and over and over again. And like typography, it's a skill. You learn it and you become better at it as you keep doing it. Same thing with presenting. A lot of people ask me um, how I've gotten to this place in my 50-year-old life and I say I'm not that good. I'm just really unwilling to give up. <laughs> I I've gotten to a place where I realize that I want to have a, a good life. I want to have a life that I feel proud of. And the only way that you can do that is to keep trying, to keep persisting. I, I also talk a lot to my students about sports stats. You know, Babe Ruth was one of the greatest players, baseball players ever to have played. And his stats show that he failed actually at bat more than he succeeded which is pretty remarkable. Most all baseball players fail at bat more than they succeed. But that doesn't mean that they stop going up to bat. And so I think that we have to expect that a good portion of the time we're gonna strike out. But there's probably 35 or 40% of the time that we're gonna get on base and maybe 10 or 15% of the time that we might hit it out of the stadium. And those are the moments that I live for, hitting it out of the stadium. And so for those that are really at the very beginnings of their career, I would suggest not to compromise. I will vividly remember that moment on Bleecker Street and Sixth Avenue in 1983 when I chose to compromise because I was afraid. And so I think that if you see this opportunity as one of the few in your life where you have very little to lose, probably don't have a mortgage, probably don't have kids, Now's the time that you can try and fail. And if you think that you're too busy to do something, I want to talk to you about what busy means. I think busy is a four-letter word. 
I think busy is never about busy in the same way that sex is not about sex and money is never about money. Busy is a way of organizing your priorities. And we use being busy or thinking that we're busy as a reason not to do something that we really want to do. If you're not doing something that you really want to do, then you really don't want to do it. If you really want to do something, you will find the time to do it. So be honest with yourself. If you're not doing something that you tell yourself that you want to be doing, it means that you don't want to be doing it. And so figure out either how to do it or what to do instead. And ultimately, I think it's important to consider the two ways of living. You can live out of fear, where everything in front of you is something that is unnerving, or you can live out of power, where everything could be an opportunity if you let it. And so I think in order to strive for a remarkable life, you have to decide that you want one. Because if you expect less, less is all you're going to get. And so I hope that the force be with you. <laughs> and I thank you for your time and for coming out in this miserable weather. Thank you very, 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 very much. <laughs> the young woman with the pretty scarf. Uh, I got divorced, I went into therapy, and I decided that I hated what I was doing. And so here, like on every aspect of my life, I felt that I was failing, and I didn't know what to do. And actually, a friend of mine was dying. A friend of mine was dying of AIDS, and he died. And at the time, I remember Brian was so vibrant and had so much hope for a remarkable life. He worked so hard. He worked harder than anybody I ever had met. And I thought, why is Brian dying? And at the time, I actually thought I should die instead of Brian. And I knew at that moment that I had to make some significant changes and try to live a life that I could be proud of. I said it would be a little revealing, sorry. <laughs> How's that for a downer? <laughs> Let's ask another question, please. <laughs> yes, oh, no. Oh, is that a person in the back or just stretching? No, okay. Yes, yes. Um, so the question is, do I um, present work or do we send work? Um, I think that it, it is critical that we position our work, that we talk about the strategic reasons that something may or may not be successful. Especially if somebody, if a client asks you to do something specific. Oh, can you make that logo bigger? Or can you make that um, logo gigantic? Or can you make that logo like take up the entire pack? Um, it's really, really important that you talk about your work in a way that creates a framework around what the criteria for success is. It's really important to, especially in your creative brief, determine what your criteria for success is. And so then again, it be doesn't become this subjective, arbitrary, ambiguous feedback. Are we meeting our objectives? Are we doing what we agreed that we would do? And here's how we've done it. So I think it's critical. I think it's mandatory that we present our own work. Yes. Um, so the question is whether or not I think uh, getting a graduate degree is a valuable thing now. Oh, a degree in something else. You know, one of my giant regrets um, was not getting a graduate degree. And I think there's a, some irony in the fact that I'm chair of a master's program and I don't have a master's degree. Um, but there were no, there are no, up until now, there weren't any master's degrees in what I do. Um, and so I think that if I had to do it again, I, I would actually do a couple of things. I would learn how to read music, I would learn how to speak other languages, and I would go to graduate school. Because I think 
we should always be learning. And that one or two years after you get your undergraduate degree, you have this, this, this infinitesimal amount of time to continue to really spend your life learning. And in as much as we should always be continuing to learn, to have that extra time to broaden your horizons is, is a gift. If you can afford it, if you have the time to do it, then you should do it. I mean, I didn't have the money or the inclination at the time. Um, and so it wasn't something that I even considered. I knew that I had to graduate and get a job and pay my rent. Um, and so I didn't have the opportunity. If you have the, the good fortune to be able to do it, I would absolutely recommend doing it. As far as getting a graduate degree in design, I think it really depends on what your passions are. If you have passions in cultural anthropology, then go for it. If you have passions in psychology, then all of these things will inform your work and make you a better designer. Not to say that the skills aren't important, because c clearly they are. I still have palpitations when I see bad type. I mean, truly, I do. Um, and everybody in my office knows it. It's like, hide the type. Um, but, but I do think that, if, that every opportunity we have to continue to be educated is a blessing. Yes, sir. Well, there really isn't any branding masters in business schools. The only other really um, branding-oriented uh, degree program is at Virginia Commonwealth University, and that is uh, branding and advertising, and it has more of an advertising slant, I believe. Um, and um, Stanford has the designs, the D School, but that's an MBA. The master's program at the School of Visual Arts is a master's in professional uh, studies, and so it's really specifically created for people that want to pursue branding as a career. And I can talk to you more about that if you'd like. One more? Yes. Is that Lydia? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> So the question is about how do I extend my own knowledge? Um, I stalk Michael Beirut. <laughs> you think I'm joking. No, it's easy. Um, I, I, I read. I read all the time. I'm, I'm crazy, crazy into reading. And so I spend as much time as I can uh, on the internet and learning and forcing myself to think about things in new ways. Um, which can also be terrifying. You know, I get, you get to a point in your life where you don't really like to do things you don't do well, and I have to constantly remind myself that I can't keep being comfortable all the time as much as I want to be, that it's really important that I put myself in situations where I am being forced to learn. So I do a lot of um, continuing education, and I've always done that. I try to do at least one thing a year. So thank you, everybody, for coming tonight, today.